um, you know, you, you see these tragedies, you have the, the, the creeks, you have people lighting their, their drinking faucet on fire, and, and you just have to wonder how did all this happen? And you know, we're lucky this evening, as Mr. Sestak pointed out, that we actually have an expert uh, on the stage this evening on fracking because uh, Ms. McGinty really, along with Governor Rendell, brought fracking to Pennsylvania. Um, and there were two things that were never gotten right about fracking when it was instituted in this state, arguing whether we should have had it or not. And that is one, no fracking company pays uh, a tax uh, to uh, excise our gas from our land, which is again, outrageous. And two, we've never had the kind of environmental controls that, have preve that could have prevented the kind of spills, the accidents, uh, the creek contaminations that we see in the news and the explosions that kill people. And it was never taken care of and instituted correctly at first. And we in this country and we in this state need to address that head on and make sure that those two conditions are met. Ms. McGinty. Well, thank you. So it's election season and we have some campaign flip-flopping happening uh, here. Uh, Congressman Sestak in his book that is the foundation of his campaign calls fracking the common good and actually waves regulators off to not step on uh, that rustic spirit uh, and pioneering spirit of our energy developers. Look, one thing is absolutely clear. Uh, I am proud of the fact that I've dedicated my entire life uh, to protecting the environment. Uh, the League of Conservation Voters in standing with me in this race uh, have done so calling me a champion, lifelong champion uh, for a clean energy economy and taking on the issue of climate change. I, with Al Gore, my first boss, uh, worked to put on the first hearings on climate change and have uh, continued to work on that issue throughout my career. I'm also proud that it was under my watch that Pennsylvania became uh, one of the very uh, foremost states in the country. 3,000 new jobs in solar energy, in wind energy. That's why the solar and wind uh, energy uh, industry has thrived. We put forward our, that effort and it was successful. Right. Thank you, Ms. McGinty. Okay, two rebuttals for you. Uh, Mr. Fetterman. Yeah. At a previous debate, Ms. McGinty said she had never received any contributions from the oil and gas industry and denied it. And I expressed some astonishment because that's not true. She's received well in six figures from the oil and gas industry, which is fine. Own your donors. And I never understand why during the campaign, uh, Ms. McGinty wants to run away from her history in fracking. Embrace what you've done. Embrace these things that you've done in your career. But again, you can't have it both ways. There's no such thing as a green fracker. You know, um, own what you've done. Okay, Ms. McGinty, you can rebut the rebuttal. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fetterman's, or should I say Pat Toomey's allegations, because they sound just like his, have been looked at, examined by the press, and not only called baseless, but actually a head scratcher. One of the not people true. who uh, was on Mr. Fetterman's list is supposedly supportive of the fracking industry was a gentleman who spends his entire career, he supports me, he spends his entire career suing the fracking industry. That's, that's categorically the bottom false. line that's is false. I am supported by uh, the solar industry, the wind industry. I am not supported by the frackers and drillers. And every one of us on this stage, yes, does have some support from folks who work in and around the all energy right, industry. Right. Mr. Federman's actually a much higher percentage of his Ms. Uh, McGinty, contributions. Of Ms. McGinty, wait, wait, Thank just you. a minute. Wait, wait, Mr. Federman, Mr. Sestek wants to weigh in here, then we'll get back to you for Thank one you. quick Katie, you have remark. twice been misleading. In my book, I call it a common good of Pennsylvanians. And what I say is we need a tax because the United States Navy developed at millions of dollars the sonar that frackers needed to do their work. And the diamond ditch drill was developed by us with our taxpayers' money. That's our common good, and there should be a tax on it before we extract it. But first, a moratorium to get it right. And that's how the book says it in every article I've written. Please don't mislead. And that's not right, Katie. Look, we shouldn't be throwing stones, but you know darn well, as the Lord said, All right, Mr. let the sinner spend for stone, and yet the Supreme Court actually reprimanded you for ethics of giving Mr. Sestak, dollars Mr. to Sestak. another company with a conflict of interest. Mr. Sestak, we need to let Mr. Federman sure. weigh in one last time. This is, and this is it. We're moving on to the next question. Yeah, to, to actually say that I get more money from the oil and gas industry than you do. Uh, the, the donation you questioned was from a, a gentleman uh, named Doug Campbell, and he's an attorney downtown, and he gave me $2,300 as a friend. 
you have received $170,000 from the oil and gas industry. We put it in an ad, we put it out, and it's never been refuted, and you can't it's refute just it. Not Please right, don't right. say. It's not true. Yeah, it is it not is true. All right, candidates, we are going to move on to the I do not have a penny from an oil company, a gas company. Yeah. I yeah. do have. Uh, S stop splitting hairs. From salt. It's not splitting hairs, John. All right, you, are, you, are, you are accusing me of something that is just not true. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. McGinty got in her last rebuttal of the rebuttal. Now we're going to move on to Bob Mayo's question, and that starts with Mr. Fetterman. Under what circumstances would you support use of ground troops in Syria, and why? And is the United States going to have to become more deeply military involved in the Middle East in order to deal with ISIS? Sure. I can't conceive of a circumstance in, in Syria, as it's playing out right now, that would, would uh, warrant uh, sending troops into to this country. Um, you know, we in this country have s failed to learn our lesson uh, over wars of choice, and that first started back in the Vietnam War, where at, at Harvard I had the good fortune of coming across Robert McNamara, who was the defense secretary that started the Vietnam War, and he said that the Vietnam War categorically was a mistake, it didn't have to happen. And we didn't learn this lesson in this country because, lo and behold, we went into Iraq, and that was a war of choice that ended disastrously uh, uh, for this country. So why in, this, uh, why in the world would we want to send troops into Syria now when we have no idea what's really going on there on the ground? It's a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, between us and the former Soviet Union, and it's something that we need to demand that countries in the Middle East step up and take care of this situation. And we in this country have to step up and take more of the Syrian refugees that are fleeing this horrible situation into our borders. Ms. McGinty. Thank you. Um, I also don't see a case for ground troops in Syria. Um, at its fundamental level, this is a civil war and a war that has had uh, reverberations over centuries, sending young men and women from America into that situation uh, does not promise to do anything other than take our young lives and further inflame that situation. However, I do think we ought to accelerate what has been working. Our airstrikes supporting uh, Kurd and Sunni troops on the ground have effectively taken back some 40% uh, of the caliphate. And that's absolutely critical because that caliphate is the training ground um, from whence the um, radicals that we see now in Europe and elsewhere have been trained. Uh, second, we need to cut off the lifeblood uh, of ISIS. And here I have a, a significant disagreement with Pat Toomey. Uh, there is an expert that President Obama has tried to have confirmed who's the expert in cutting off terror financing. It's time the Senate confirms that gentleman. All right, thank you, Ms. McGinty. Mr. Sestak. There's such a dearth of those in the Senate who are running that understand that militaries can stop a problem. Militaries can never fix a problem. Nobody believes we fixed Iraq. I was asked in the battle group as we were about to begin the strikes by the 3rd Fleet Commander, as I purred my Carib battle group in the Persian Gulf, what do you think? I told him we were ready to go, but what a tragedy this was. Where's the clear or present danger? The second thing you have to understand, and this is why there should be no ground troops in Syria, never take the first step without knowing the last. In other words, it's not just winning the war, it's securing the peace. No policymakers really understood that after we toppled Saddam, how do you secure the peace of the Sunnis and Shias? Yes, continue the airstrikes, but no ground forces. And if you do go in with air, work with even the Putins and the Iranians there so they do the ground force. But finally this, know how would it end if we're supporting as we are the Kurds in Syria and they take over Sunni town and right, the Sunnis come you, back. Sestek. The conflict will go on forever, and diplomacy matters, and we'd have a dearth Mr. of that. Mr. Sestak, thank you. We are running out of time. So the next question is coming from Elaine Effort, and you will have only 30 seconds apiece to answer this question. We begin with you, Ms. McGinty. Elaine? Okay. Diplomatic relations between the United States and Cuba will be officially reestablished on July 20th when Cuba will open its embassy in Washington. Some people are predicting that move toward normalizing relations could lead the next Congress to warm to the idea of lifting the trade embargo. Uh, where do you stand on lifting the trade embargo against Cuba, uh, even in view when people say uh, Cuba's record on human rights will make that difficult? Where do you stand? Well, I do support the president's actions here. Um, human rights abuses need to constantly be forefront and we need to take them on. 
But I do think the overall picture after so many decades of this blockade is that many, many people are being hurt by the blockade itself. As it relates to commerce, uh, our agricultural community does have a terrific opportunity, as well as tourism, as well as technology. And I do think we should lead that charge so it's not other countries that get those opportunities. Mr. Sastak. Yes. Um, without a question, we should have done this 25 years ago. I can remember going to Getmo decades ago and peering over the fence into Cuba. Our ability to work with Soviet Union and China, how could we have not done it? except for political reasons, as happens too often. Our capitalism can work mighty fine. And also there's other areas, you bring it up. That's why I co-sponsored and fought for the International Violence Against Women's Act. All right, there thank you. There's a lot of human rights around the world that we need leaders down there to make happen, to thank fix. Thank you, Mr. Sestak. Mr. Fetterman. I'm gonna save us a lot of time and just say, I salute the president's decision to normalize relations with Cuba. It's been decades uh, coming and the fact that it hasn't occurred is, is an absurdity. We have uh, normalized relations with countries that have far worse human rights records. Um, and at the end of the day, it's just plain silly that we even waited this long. We now begin with our clothing, closing statements and you are the one to start, Mr. Sestek. Each of you gets one minute. I thank everyone. And Katie and John, thank you. And Katie, I just wish that you had kept it on a positive level as we have done over the following past months. Because the biggest issue we have in America today is trust. That's why I walked 422 miles across Pennsylvania to begin to earn the trust of people. Because it doesn't matter who endorses me. Because people no longer trust politicians of either party. I know. I went to those 800 events everywhere to meet with others throughout this state. I don't want to just win. I would like to govern. But most of all, I want people to know that no matter what, I will have their back. In the military, we say, I will have your six, because your back is your most vulnerable. You can't see there as you go forward. I did it in the military for our nation. You were there for me to save my daughter for health care. That's why I only ran as a congressman, to have the sixth of everyone by fighting for the Affordable Care Act. But it's why I turned down those lobbying jobs. I went to teach, and the only reason I want to serve is to earn the trust of people so I can govern with the trust of the people of Pennsylvania. Thank you, thank Mr. You Sestak. Much. Ms. McGinty. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity this evening. I'm in this race to stand with working families, to fight to rebuild the middle class. It's time to bring good manufacturing jobs back to this Commonwealth and this country. It's time to rebuild our infrastructure. And if you've worked hard, your paycheck should show it. It's your turn. If you have earned your Social Security as you have, I will stand against any attempt to take that away from you. You know, Wall Street has had the upper hand for too long. It's time for working families to be able to provide for themselves, their children. Those families are the backbone of our community. And I know when we invest in good schools, when we give people a chance through job training and apprenticeship programs, and when we put people back to work believing in Pennsylvania and believing in America, we can and we will be second to none. I'm Katie McGinty, and I ask for the honor of your support in this race. Mr. Fetterman. Hi. I want to thank everybody for, for tuning in, and I'm sure we're going to lose quickly out to the Pirates. Uh, but <laughs> at, at the end of the day, uh, leadership is more than mechanically reciting talking points. It's about actually uh, living and breathing what you believe in. And what I believe in is service. And that's why I've been the mayor of one of the most challenged communities in Pennsylvania for the last 11 years. You might be watching me in McKeesport. You might be watching me in Manesson. You might be watching me in Sh uh, Sharon. These are the kind of communities that have been left behind. These are the kind of communities that need a champion. And for me, my whole job is being about being a champion for my community of Braddock. And for me, running for this office is about being a champion for all of these communities across Pennsylvania, not just Western Pennsylvania, not just South Central Pennsylvania, but all of Pennsylvania that need a champion and advocate in the United States Senate that currently does not have one. I want to thank you for this opportunity to share our story, and I ask for your support as I run for this office. Candidates, thank you very much you. for a both lively and informative debate. And panelists, thank you for enlightening questions and helping move this along. Thank you. And that concludes our debate. Thank you to the Pennsylvania Association of Broadcasters for their assistance in tonight's debate. Please remember to get out and vote Tuesday, April 26th. 
It is a great privilege of our democracy. So please exercise it. Your vote does count. I'm Sally Wigan. Good night.